Hi, this is Laura Beam from Mortgage Architects, and I'm here with the SME Podcast. You are now listening to the next great small business podcast. Welcome to the SME Stories Podcast, where it is all about small businesses in Canada. And here's your host, Ken Alfred. Hey everybody, thanks for on the show. We got a great episode today with Laura Beam. Laura Beam is a mortgage agent. Now, a little bit about Laura. After over 20 years in the corporate world, she got licensed as a mortgage agent in 2020. She's currently working as an agent at Mortgage Architects, part of the DLC Group, which is one of the largest brokerages in Canada. She's also part of an amazing team that does over $250 million in mortgages every year. Now, on a personal note, Laura loves to travel and is a cruising expert. She would love to talk travel all day long, she actually won a family, she actually won her family a free cruise. So looking forward to hearing about how she did that. She also has a hobby farm with over 100 animals, and she's also married with two children. So it's going to be a very interesting story today with Laura, and I'm looking forward to hearing about uh, all the things that she can do for aspiring mortgage agents. So sit back and absorb. But anyways, back to yourself there, Laura. What has been, like you've been doing this for like the last few years, mm -hmm. what has been like your biggest success, but also your biggest failure so far running your business? Hmm. Um, biggest failure, I would say a couple, and I'd say um, part of this for anyone that's listening that's looking to be a mortgage agent is definitely making sure that you interview your brokerage. So um I think I, so just definitely making sure you interview your brokerage. There's tons of questions out there that you can ask. Um, but that would be the first piece is definitely uh, really interviewing your brokerage. Uh, and I, there was definitely some examples in the beginning where I had turned people away or said that there wasn't a product available that had I had uh, a mentor or someone I could lean on, I could have walked them through that situation and actually found out that there was a product available. So there was deals I kind of lost in the beginning that I know I could have had if I actually had kind of some resources to help there, which I take responsibility for, but that uh, was definitely a challenge. Um, learning curve. Yeah, That's learning basically curve. what it is, yeah. right? Yeah. And and again, the mortgage industry is actually, it's surprising to me. It's a very, very low barrier to entry. Um, I was talking to a realtor last week and uh, had let her know, like, it's a one-week course that you take to become a mortgage agent. A realtor is like a six to nine, one-year-long course. Um, it's a very low barrier to entry. But what ends up happening is you walk out and you don't actually know how to do a mortgage properly. And there's just, to my point earlier, every lender has different products and programs. So it's not enough to say, you know how to do mortgages. Like you literally need to learn all the different lenders programs. So that's tough. Um, biz biggest success, I would say that um, I, uh, I've definitely on the flip side have saved some deals that other banks or mortgage agents haven't been able to do that literally have saved someone's purchase. So um, I would say that's kind of my biggest success story and that it's, like I said, it, I've run an entirely referral based business. So, um, every job or client I do get is uh, a result of someone kind of recommending me and putting their trust in me, which is huge when you're dealing with someone's like literally like their biggest financial purchase they'll ever make. Yeah, no, that's great to hear. I mean, the fact you're able to find being very creative and finding solutions, I think is something that I think a lot of people they probably do have it. They just, for some reason, don't know that it's a, it's available, hmm. right? Like you can be very creative as long as within the realms of, you know, legality, mm -hmm. making yep. sure you're not screwing over anything. Yep. Like we're not talking about creative accounting no, 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 here. No, 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 Yeah, yeah. But you're talking like different products, different product mixes that could actually make, we can make this deal work. Yep. That everyone's making money at the end and making money, saving money, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when people have to really become very creative in that perspective. Like mm -hmm. not just to say, oh, that's it. This one doesn't offer this. Okay, we throw them out. Right. We don't think about it. It's like, could we work with this? Right. Maybe we could. Right. right. So that's pretty good to know. Hey, do you need an error-free website? Do you need transcription that's accurate and on time? Would you like to remove noise from your video or audio recording? Do you need a spokesperson for your business? If so, we can help. At Northway Capital Group, we are happy to announce that we are now providing website testing services, audio transcriptions, and audio cleanup, as well as spokesperson services. We would love to help you on your next project. Contact us for more information at northwaycapitalgroup at gmail.com. Now it's time for tips from the pro. 
Uh, all right, so now we're going to hit our tips from the pro segment. So now we have the aspiring mortgage agent that says, Laura, I want to become a mortgage agent. And here are some questions I need you to let me know so I don't step on any landmines when I go out there. So question number one, what is your best tip on how to separate a new mortgage agent from the competition? I think you need to, and I do struggle with this. So I think you need to find a niche. So you, and it's a bit of a balance when you're first starting is that you do want to try different mortgages, commercial, reverse, residential, um, to be able to see which one you like, but then end up finding a niche because you can't be everything to everybody. Uh, it just gets con too confusing for the consumer. So find a niche um, in the market. And I also think that will help you become more successful. All right. Can you give some examples of some of those niches? That was going to be my follow-up oh, question wow, for that. Is that, that what are some planned. different, <laughs> I know, what are some other niches that people can think? So they think I can only do residential. So residentials. Okay. What else can I do there? And I think you touched a little bit like lines of credit, uh, uh, renewals, what other things, what are the niches that people can think about when they start out? Yeah, I'll give you some general ones and I'll let you know what mine are. So, uh, so you can do kind of commercial or residential are the two kind of um, like in general components. Uh, and then underneath you can do purchases, refinance um, or switches, as I mentioned before. And this is, I'm talking on the residential side, the commercial side is very challenging. Um, so I'm gonna leave that piece be. Um, and then within that, there's a lot of different products. So you can do uh, equity programs for people that have like a lot of equity in their house, but may not have a lot of income. Um, you can deal with high net worth clients. So people that have like a ton of uh, investments, but maybe not a lot of income, like the client I spoke about previously. Um, in my case, I uh, specialize in two areas. So one is mortgages for folks that are self-employed. Uh, so my husband uh, has been self-employed kind of the whole time we've been together. Uh, and when we purchased the house that we're in now, my father-in-law actually had to come on the mortgage with us because we couldn't qualify because on paper, he didn't make a lot of income. So um, there are now I know tons of pro programs out there that can help uh, the self-employed. And had I known about those kind of all those years ago, we could have qualified on our own and actually uh, not had my father-in-law come on. And then I mentioned this already, but switches. So if you're up for renewal, that's another area I specialize in. Um, and uh, have a lot of success there. Interesting. And I know this is like a different question, but so are you still getting the, are you still getting people calling and reaching out to you saying, all right, I'm on a variable. Should I switch to fixed or vice versa? Yeah. Yes. So I check in with my variable clients, every bank of Canada meeting, uh, both before and after I sometimes I so you're calling them a lot lately over the last yes, few months I'm assuming yes right? I, and I do <laughs> feel like the grim reaper I honestly I honestly do it's it's the worst it's the worst call to need to make um yes and every time we assess that situation uh and for some people there was a reason we went variable in the first place and that reason hasn't changed so uh, I have one client as an example who uh, isn't sure they're going to stay in their house. So we put them in a variable product so that if they do decide to move, they have a really small penalty. Um, uh, that would be, so that reason hasn't changed for that person. So in your case, yep, you need to stay where you are in the mortgage, not necessarily in the home. Uh, and then other people, yeah, you're losing sleep every night. Go ahead. I think it's time for you to lock in. You're going to stay there. We're not concerned about a penalty later. Um, and it's literally causing you kind of emotional stress. So yes, maybe now's the time to lock in. So yeah, having those conversations um, and depends on the person about whether or not they're making a change. Yeah, because I think the thing that I always un understood, because I remember thought when I first started, what was it 20, was it, when did they start increasing the rates? Was it early 2022? Uh, it was er March of 2022. March 2022. So yep. that's when they started increasing the rates. Yep. And I remember looking at a few uh, videos from different, mortgage people and they were saying they're answering the question should i switch yes or no mm -hmm. and at least from what the ones that were saying don't switch and i know like i said you're the expert on this they were saying that yes the rates are going up mm -hmm. but the the town the downside is that if you if you jump to fixed you might you're going to be locked in at that rate mm -hmm. but then when rates start to go down you're still kind of stuck mm -hmm. at that consistent rate mm -hmm. so that was they're saying is that if you can if you can ride through it mm -hmm. through some of these increases variable is still quote unquote, quote unquote better mm -hmm. than fixed. Mm -hmm. what, what's your opinion on that? 
well, right now, if you switched and just locked in, right, you didn't go to a different term or you didn't do anything, you would be locking in at a 17-year high, right? We're at a 17-year high for fixed rates. The other challenge is, which a lot of people don't know, is depending on the lender, you sometimes will lock in for a brand new five-year term. So even though you're kind of two years into your five-year term, let's pretend, you're not locking in for three years, you're locking in for five. That does depend on the lender. Um, so not only are you locking in at a 17-year high, you're now locking in for five five more years. Uh, and the client I talked to a couple of weeks ago that was actually considering locking in, I said, you need to not look at those rates. Like you you need to like let it ride, right? If you're going to lock in, you can't be comparing yourself because exactly what you said, the rates are scheduled to come down starting in 2024. Uh, and you're not going to have that benefit because now you, you're locked in for, in their case, another five-year term. Okay. Good to know. Good mm -hmm. to know. All right. Back to the business questions here. So what are some tips that you can give the new mortgage agent to, I guess, make sure they have enough capital to run their business? That is a great question. And I actually would recommend this to anyone that's going in to become self-employed. And I also did not take my own advice here. So this is me learning <laughs> my own lesson the hard way is if you are in a normal, call it corporate job or salary job, do your uh, mortgage financing before you leave. So uh, what I do recommend is where possible, uh, try to put a home equity line of credit uh, on your house. And this is not me as a mortgage agent. This is me as a newly self-employed person is it's hard when you start a business for the, at the beginning. So that home equity line of credit will be there in case you run into problems, but you also can't qualify for a mortgage if you need one, if you've just started. So I did not do that. So I learned that lesson the hard way. So anyone that's looking to become self-employed, that is what I would recommend doing. And what I think Laura and I also recommending is not to max out that oh, line no, of credit no, to no. try and fund your business. No, no, no. But just having that, yes. just having a little bit yes. of money that, that that's there as a backup, that if you need to pull from it a little bit, mm -hmm. like you said, whether it's advertising expenses, you want to purchase a new software for your business, maybe even buy a new computer for your business, you can use it pay it back. Yep. But uh, if let's say you got like a 120 grand line of credit, don't pull it all out just so you can like buy every single thing under the sun, right. just to think that you're ready without anything coming into the into the into the fold, right? Yeah. And actually, to be honest, I'm actually recommending it more for your life. Like you still need to pay your mortgage while you're starting up this business, you still need to buy those really expensive groceries. Um, and uh, it can be a challenge. And just as an example in the mortgage industry and in a lot of self-employed industries is I, I started talking to someone on the weekend for a pre-approval. They're probably not going to purchase until June. I probably won't get paid till July. Like you don't have that constant money flow coming in, especially in the beginning. Um, so that line of credit will give you a bit of a buffer if you do need to go to Costco, buy some groceries for the house and you're out of money because you, you might be as you're starting a business. I saw this funny meme, I think it was on Facebook or Instagram or something where they're saying the currency of the year. So 2020, I think 2020, they're saying that you showed a picture of toilet paper. Mm -hmm. That was like yeah. a new currency. Mm -hmm. And apparently in 2023, I don't know, I can't remember what the 21 and 22 was, but 2023, they showed a picture of eggs because mm -hmm. apparently eggs seems to be the new currency because it's just really expensive right mm -hmm. now. But anyways, back to, uh, I'm just thinking about eggs. I don't know why, but anyways, uh, what, how many deals? should a mortgage agent kind of have to kind of get that longevity to last a little bit longer in, in your business, right? So like you said, you, you're not going to get paid right away. So someone says, yes, Laura, we want to go with you to find us a mortgage. You don't actually get paid as soon as they say yes to that, because to my correct my knowledge, you only get paid once the deal closes, right? Is that correct? And sometime after that, that's another kind of um, thing that people don't understand is it's uh, lenders also only pay your brokerage on a set schedule. So there are some deals that I closed in December that I'm just getting the complete payment in February because of how the lender pays us. So yeah, it can, can be quite a long time. Other lenders pay us right away, but yes, it's not until the, the home closes. So um, that's a hard question for me to answer because I do think it depends on your goal. So like what my answer would be versus another agent could be two separate ones. What I do think you need to do, and hopefully this answers your question, is have different deals throughout every stage throughout every month. So this month I have some closing, I have some brand new pre-approvals and I have some in progress. So that gives you kind of more of a steady flow. 
Um, but I wouldn't say you need X amount because my X amount might be different than someone else's. Yeah, because I mean, for the average person, if they want to, let's say, just make some money on the side and they want to do mortgages as a side gig where they just try, I know it's hard because, you know, it seems weird because it's like, that seems like a very involved process when you're helping someone with their mortgage, right? Yeah, so I did do this a little bit at part-time in the beginning um, for a whole bunch of reasons. But what I very quickly realized is, and it's like a realtor, right? You, a lot of people, you can't, there are some really good realtors that are part-time, but at the end of the day, there are mortgage emergencies, literally, where money hasn't come through and it's 2 p.m. If I was in a meeting at my day job that you couldn't drop out of that meeting to go deal with that emergency, again, you literally could compromise someone's purchase and not only compromise the purchase, you actually could end up getting sued if you're part of the reason something blew up. So I think you need, and for me, that was the other problem too, is I was just starting to get too busy um, that it didn't make sense to kind of do it on my own, but I would I think you can do a little bit at the beginning, but then I would caution yourself. You have to be in a job that's flexible that you can answer the phone. Yeah, especially because you, you you never know. I mean, yes, it's it's a nice goal to try to start it, mm -hmm. but it is hard, especially when you start to get, become more recognized and you're getting more business coming in, which is a good problem to have. I mean, mm -hmm. I think for everyone, they just want that a certain number of deals per month so just to bring in X amount of cash, yeah. right? But uh, it is a big thing, so you have to be very careful with that. And if you're in a in a business that's not very flexible, mm -hmm. maybe you don't uh, do full blown mortgages. Maybe you only pick on maybe one of the smaller niches that uh, Laura pre uh, prescribed earlier that mm -hmm. may not be so intensive. That should an emergency happen, you can't take the phone call, and now you're the reason why the deal fell through. Yeah, uh, you don't so want situations like that. Someone had recommended to me in the beginning when I let them know I was going to be part time to focus on renewals because they're not as emergency type ish right like if you were supposed to close today and uh not that i've ever tried to do this in my own business but like a renewal is not so bad because <laughs> you get a couple days buffer if something goes wrong but a purchase those are ones where like i absolutely you have to be reachable uh by your clients the lawyers the realtor and stuff goes wrong unfortunately yeah no that's great and last question on just the pro here and what is your best strategy to deal with difficult clients? I always ask this to every guest because everyone's guests, everyone's experience is different, but we always like to hear some some good tips from the pro, like, well, how do you deal with difficult clients? Mm -hmm. uh, so one benefit about this job is if you don't want to work with them, you don't have to. So you can politely refer them <laughs> to someone else. But uh, kind of all joking aside, I my biggest tip like in business period is pick up the phone. We do so much over text and email and I am full disclosure, like guilty of this a hundred percent. But whenever I have to like relay difficult news to the client or um, I just not sure how something's going to come across an email or you're butting heads with someone, just pick up the phone. Like I'm an honest believer that like 90% of problems that uh, people have can be fixed with like a quick conversation. So that would be my, my recommendation. Yeah, because uh, I guess email etiquette, I think people take it for granted of how how misunderstood emails can actually be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I mean, even running through a grammar checker where you're thinking that everything's punctuated great, but if the tone of the message is not clear and, and in your mind, mm -hmm. it's clear, mm -hmm. but to the other person's mind, they don't know you mm -hmm. or they don't know you as well. It may not be super clear because, you know, when I used to, you, you've heard of Fiverr, right? Mm -hmm. Like the online marketplace where you mm -hmm. can hire freelancers, whatever. I'm sometimes dumbfounded when I'm talking to a seller. And remember, you can't talk to them through the phone. Like it has to be through instant messaging where I'm thinking, why don't they understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. I thought my request is very simple, mm -hmm. simple actually. And I just don't get it. But, you know, sometimes the quick phone call, maybe it's because mm -hmm. you're worried about, like you said, whether it's relaying bad news or you're worried that they might be yell at you or something like that. But having something similar to say, you know what? Maybe we're not understanding each other. Let's do a quick five minute call and we'll just clear this up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Sometimes that's all it needs. Yep. 100%. You know, so. All right. So I think we're getting ready to more of the fun stuff here, which is uh, more relaxing and fun like that. So but last question on that is how do you what is your work life balance? Like, how would you give the mortgage agent who's starting off? What's the best way to maintain work life balance? So, again, I think people are at 
different seasons of their life and what's work-life balance to me might not be work-life balance for you. I think you have uh, kids that are younger than mine. Mine are 11 and 14 and they go to their rooms after dinner and I don't see them anymore. So (laughs) I'm okay to hop on a quick call uh, versus some of the other mortgage agents I work with have young kids uh, or um, different, their kids are in hockey. My kids are not in hockey. So um, I do think, I know, oh, I know we did that strategically. (laughs) Trust me. Um, (laughs) I do think, again, you have to set what works for you. Um, the job is very flexible. So I'm running to the bank this afternoon with my husband. So uh, versus, again, sometimes not so hard. Um, so I think it's a couple things. I think setting hours that work for you. Um, I use an online booking tool to let people book my calendar like you do actually for this podcast. You can block out the times that don't work for you, right? So if you don't want to be available on Tuesday and Thursday nights, um, block out Tuesday and Thursday nights. Again, it's up to you. That being said, I do think there's a, the one, one of the advantage mortgage agents have over the bank is we are accessible, right? So I have had people call me at 8 p.m. at night and I answer the phone and help either that realtor, that client through their issue. Um, and especially starting out, I don't think you can be so rigid on the kind of nine to five, but um, I think you need to set your own boundaries for what works for your life. Um, and again, if it means popping out in the middle of the afternoon, but then maybe catching up on an hour later, I, I think that's, that's in your court to decide to do. Yeah, I think that, that, that too. And I think I'll, I always relate this. My favorite tip for anything is if they on the Google calendar, it's not happening. Right? Right. That's pretty much, especially when you're trying to meet with friends or family that you don't get to see very often, mm-hmm. got to be put in there. Otherwise to assume that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Oh man. That's not, that's not going to go well. Yeah. The other thing I would say um, is really evaluate what's helping you and or your business. So I found last year I did like a lot of mortgage networking events. So I do think networking is super important, but I was doing a ton of mortgage agent networking events, which don't make it, get me wrong. Some of them I learned a ton, um, would totally do again, but other ones I'm like, you're wasting the day driving somewhere, you're paying to get in all of that stuff. And I'm meeting other mortgage agents. So I'm not meeting people that are going to actually like help me grow my business. So this year I've made a conscious effort to really evaluate kind of what events I'm going to and are they going to add value for me? Pretty much. Yeah, that that, that makes sense. I mean, it's nice to meet with fellow colleagues, Mm. but, and unless it's like you said, something totally new that, you know, whether it's new product or a new licensing thing that you guys have to follow. Okay, that's fine. But if it's not going to really give it and it's going to be something that you've kind of heard already in the past. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to go there if, if there's really no reason to go there. Yeah, absolutely. it's like you said, save the save the costs on that, right? Hey, you do you need a voiceover? Well, look no farther. Northway Capital Group has your answer. Commercials and explainer videos, AVR and voicemail, health and wellness, corporate training and e-learning announcements, documentaries and biography. Contact us on social media or email us at northwaycapitalgroup at gmail.com. Now it's time for the rapid fire round. Um, anyway, sorry. Now we're going to hit the rapid fire okay. round. This is the more fun stuff, which is more relaxing. And uh, we're really going to delve into the personality okay. of Laura as, as she here. So, all right. Now, this first one, first, some of these questions you probably heard on the episodes before, but I still like to ask them anyway. So, all right, Laura, what would the 15-year-old self be thinking you'd be doing now? Oh, a marine biologist. I really wanted to be a marine, marine biologist. biologist. Yeah. Really? I know. What was it about <laughs> uh, fish and other mammals that uh, really got you into that? I love, like, the ocean, animals, uh, obviously aquatic life. Uh, and back then, and I still think this is actually true, the only school you could do that in Ontario was Guelph. And I was worried about only one school kind of offering the situation. So yeah, it changed my mind. I think I actually would have loved it, but yes. <laughs> do you remember that movie Free Willy back in the early to mid nineties? Yes. So you remember Michael Jackson, the late Michael Jackson, he had a great, uh, he had a, he was on the main song of that soundtrack mm-hmm. and I forgot what it was called, but uh, it was a very popular song. Yep. And I was in grade school when this happened and uh, I liked animals. I loved uh, the movie was, 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 was fine as well. And we had our, our elementary school was one of the few that actually had a steel drum band. Oh, wow. yep. So in grade eight, we would actually tour around, you know, 
the GTA just to perform at different things, mm -hmm. right? And I remember everyone in class wanted to be in this song. Mm -hmm. And I think my the instructor did say everyone could be in the song. Everyone wanted to play the steel drums. But you know what instrument that I got tasked with? <laughs> I'm The maracas. <laughs> now, think of this as a 14-year-old kid going through puberty. Mm -hmm. You want to impress, you know, girls or something and stuff like that, or, or it's people you have a crush on or you, you people want to, get, you want to be attracted to. Yeah. Everyone's playing the drums and looks pretty cool. I'm just there shaking maracas. <laughs> so that's my marine biologist story. Aside from that, I love Seinfeld, that episode of uh, marine biology, but that's pretty cool as well. So, <laughs> all right. Now let's tap onto your cruise inside. Mm -hmm. Where is the best place to take a cruise? Uh, I would say either Hawaii or Greece uh, because those islands are very, very different. So people that have gone to Hawaii and they've only gone to Oahu, I'm like, you need to see more places. And I feel like a cruise is the best way to do that because you unpack for one week and you have the boat take you around. So Hawaii or Greece would be my two recommendations. You got to jump into that point here where you talk about you got a free cruise for your family. I explained that. I saw that in the intro and then the listeners are going to hear that. So they want to hear more about how you got the free cruise. Yes. Yeah, so last year we were on a transatlantic cruise. So traveling across the ocean. Uh, and if, for those that haven't cruised before, when you cruise and play games, you get these little raffle tickets. And then once a week they or once a trip, sorry, they will pull a raffle ticket to um, give someone a five day cruise for free. Uh, and they always get a junior cruiser, so a kid to pull the ticket. And they actually had called my daughter up to do the draw. And I said, well, I just want to confirm if she pulls our ticket that we can still win. And the cruise director was like, like that's going to happen. And out of literally 10,000 tickets, my daughter pulled our ticket. So we won a free cruise last year. Uh, and we went, to the, we went to Bermuda for five days. And my daughter won us the cruise. And no one called shenanigans, right? No one said, wait a minute. It's actually, all joking aside, it's actually very, they take it very seriously. Like it's recorded um, and things like that. And if you saw how many tickets are there, it's impossible to like do anything crazy because there's literally like thousands and thousands of tickets. And the follow-up funny story to that is on our free cruise um, that same year, we were one number away from winning it again. Yeah, <laughs> another potential free yeah. cruise i actually thought we really? won with what my husband had said but then i realized we were one number away so yeah and which was the cruise line you you took when you won the free cruise so you said so we love norwegian so we're big cruisers so ncl is who we love to go with although we have uh gone on most of the other kind of larger cruise lines no because we did our cruise last year, back in 2020. Yeah, last 2022. We actually did the MSC cruise. That's what we decided to, to go with. And I hadn't been on a cruise ship since 1995. Yep. And I'm assuming technologies and boating have changed mm -hmm. before I got on our cruise. Because when I went on that cruise in 95, I was my parents were just so happy. They were saying, oh, we got such a great deal. And I'm like, okay, sure. The first time on a cruise, not mm -hmm. a big deal. Then we were on the cruise. And I can tell you now, Laura, I'm looking around, I'm like, wow, I see a lot of grandmas and grandpas. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yep. I don't see any very many people my age, mm -hmm. right? And then I found out that my parents booked a senior's cruise to save money on it. Oh. Right? So I was like, Depending on right. the line, you can definitely, we are usually in the younger demographic, that's for sure. <laughs> well, yeah, and I think my only recommendation, we had a great cruise for MSC that my kids want to go back. The only thing that they didn't have that I wish they did, mm -hmm. uh, soft serve ice cream maker on some oh, cruise wow. lines. they didn't have that my kids love that they i i lose count actually in a day how many ice cream cones they have and you know what Laura, my last cruise that we went on i actually made a conscious effort that we were there for let's say seven days mm -hmm. i worked out five straight oh, days wow, that's good you know to I make sure to burn the off best intentions and then it doesn't happen. yeah <laughs> <laughs> but i still i still ended up uh still ended up gaining a couple of cruise pounds because mm -hmm. you know like uh, not to sidetrack too much but my wife and I, we try to use as natural as we can, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, we try to, you know, we try not to do the canola oil too much, except for our fast food days, which is once a week. So we're happy with that. But we were so good with eating with coconut oil or olive oil, anything other than canola oil. Right. We were always good. But when you get to a cruise, you can't really pick and choose <laughs> what you have. Even the steam, even the vegetables yeah. that could be a stir fry is cooked in canola oil. Yeah. So I was looking at my face. I'm like, why is my face so swollen <laughs> in some of these pictures? It's because... No matter what, right. that's what they use. But uh, anyways, so you say Hawaii or Greece? Yeah. 
Good would be to my know. top two. Good to know. Yep. Not not the not the Caribbean or anything like that, or is that just do you think that's overplayed? To be honest, I'd go anywhere on a cruise. I literally, but you just yeah. said, what are the best <laughs> places? Those are the two that I would say just because I think they're very, like I said, I don't think you can go to Hawaii and go to one island. So to be honest, cruising is just the best option to go to like all five or whatever. So, um, oh yeah, I, I, we've been to Europe, uh, Caribbean, that kind of, I don't, I don't have any restrictions, but those would nice. be my recommendations. All right. What are your guilty pleasures? So I'm a big movie fan. I go to the movies every week with one of my girlfriends. We go like literally really? every week to the movies. Yep. I can follow me on Instagram for my reviews of the movies because we do review them every week. <laughs> um, we do travel quite a bit. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I guess those are my two guilty pleasures. All right. But let me ask you this. And you, since you brought up the movie thing, what has been like your favorite movie and least favorite movie? I uh, I can answer that. So th it's hard to say favorite ever, but I would say recently we really really loved A Man Called Otto. That was great. The Tom Hanks movie was fabulous. I, I was going to say that's yeah, the Tom Hanks one, right? I gave it ten out of ten. Uh, my girlfriend gave it nine out of ten. So just be a little. She's a little. So you're not harsher. friends with her anymore. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we the worst movie we have ever seen is it's called My Idiot Brother, and it was horrible. And I'm just even to this day we still talk about it. it was like years ago if you looked up when that movie was uh made uh it was so bad i was like thank god there's there's no one else in my in the theater because you actually like we're talking and on our phones it was horrible don't even bother Who's watching that movie it. uh i think it's paul rudd if memory serves me correct I, it, i'm pretty sure it's him i can't remember who played his sisters in the movie it's horrible it's terrible 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 yeah i'll tell you the worst movie i think i ever saw was you remember when the, you remember those when scary movie came out mm. back in the day where uh, for those who don't familiar, it's like scary movie franchises of movies were, were were a bunch where they kind of mocked a lot of the popular movies at the time, mm -hmm. right? So at the time, I remember this is when uh, you know I, I was watching this thing. It was called Rise of the Spartans because the movie Three Hundred, which is one of my favorite oh, yeah. movies. Yep. So they tried to make it. They, so this was a comedy. Obviously, it was a really stupid comedy movie where it was about, especially during that time where Three Hundred was very popular. Also, the, the that I think that documentary March of the Penguins oh. was also around that same yeah. time frame where they were very popular. Mm -hmm. So these people decided to make a movie where they're mocking everything about <laughs> it to the point where it was so over the top. And I love stupid movies sometimes, yeah. right? Like I could I can watch a Will Ferrell movie and enjoy it, yeah. right? But it was so dumb that I literally had to stop watching after like five minutes mm -hmm. because it was too much for even me. Mm -hmm. And the one other movie that uh, I have to admit. I didn't mind it, but my but Mrs. K, my wife, really hated it. it. Was Journey to the Center of the Earth? I think it was like a Will Ferrell movie back in, I'd like to say mid two thousands. Mm -hmm. It got to the point so we're in our house in Stouffville. We rented it from Blockbuster oh, when wow. <laughs> Blockbuster was still around. Yeah, it was on DVD. We watched it. My wife uh, finished the movie. Yeah, she didn't talk. She just got up off the couch, yeah. and I never spoke to her for two days. <laughs> she wouldn't speak to her for two days because it was so bad. Yeah. But uh, I, I don't know what you could say when about that. When you do but, go every uh, week, you tend to see. We saw the menu the other day, and it was not good. That was another one that was like, I, we didn't even understand. It was like not good. So, yeah, the menu was I think another. I, think I, saw, I think I saw some YouTube reviews of that, the, the menus. Not it's good. The, uh, not good at all? No. So overrated from some of the people on YouTube oh, who were yeah. saying that it was yes, the best yes, movie. Yes, yes. Okay. Yep. Good to know. Best movie? Right, wow, couple... definitely don't follow them. That was not good. <laughs> <laughs> or at least they, they you know, because sometimes if people don't want to watch the movie, they'll watch a YouTube channel where they kind of walk through the movie, mm. where they kind of explain it. And they, obviously they say spoilers or like, right, spoilers right. ahead, because this is going to be, we're telling you what's happening in the movie. But they kind of walk through it, but they made it sound like it was the greatest movie, at least of the year. I don't see oh, ever. Oh, wow. no, 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 no. Because how else can you describe that the best movie of the year was us, was obviously... Austin Powers too. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But that was one of my favorite uh, sequels of all time. Okay. But, uh, all right. So back to food now. If you were to have your own sandwich, what would be on it? What would it be called? Uh, so I don't really eat sandwiches. Um, call it whatever you want. Whatever. Burger, steak, something. Okay. What would you call well, it? Well, okay. I actually love a grilled cheese, grilled peanut butter and jam sandwich. So you make a peanut butter and jam and you grill it like you would uh grilled cheese so can i go with that hmm. as my answer they're delicious 
grilled yeah like a grilled cheese like you would butter each side and do it in the pan it's so good yeah never thought about that oh it's so good. well that's your special sandwich what sure. is it called is it, what would you call it uh the triple b because that's my nickname the chip, from the triple b <laughs> from uh, uh previous corporate life so yes the triple b triple b yeah Put on a shirt. All yeah. right. Last question. What is your theme song and why? So that song hits. You're walking down the street. People know Laura's coming. Oh, my gosh. Um, I don't know. Um, I should have prepped for this question because I'm not actually sure. I never prep. And just so the listeners know, I don't prep my guests in any way, shape, or form. I don't send them the questions we're going to ask. Okay. Literally, their first response is what you're hearing is, natural which is what i prefer maybe you should so. prep us because now i'm like dumb. <laughs> so um let's go with uh don't stop believing just because i think you like have especially as a self-employed person you have to don't stop believing i think i honestly do think and i've thought about this a lot over the past kind of years i think there's a lot of people that give up really quickly in the self-employed industry if we want to call it that and i think they're just on the cusp of uh, becoming successful. And I think people just give up too easily. So don't stop believing is what I'm going to go with. Can't go wrong with that one. So where can listeners reach out to you if they want to do business with you or even just pick your brains, Laura? Yeah. So um, Instagram or Facebook, I have a site on uh, both of those. So Laura Beam Mortgage Agent, uh, and I have a website as well, Beam Mortgages. So any of those three areas, you can grab me. All right. Well, thanks again for being on the show, Laura. It was, a, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Do you have a small business story to share? The SME Stories Podcast is looking for entrepreneurs to share their tales of success, failure, and everything. If you're interested in being a guest on our show or know someone would be a great fit, please contact us at Northway Capital Group at gmail.com. That's Northway Capital Group at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to the SME Stories Podcast, which is owned by Northway Capital Group. Please follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Northway Capital Group.